the sovereign will of God. God, uh, you hear the theologians say that God has his sovereign will, which is precisely what he wants, and then his permissive will, which is what he allows to happen. And although it's true that God can cause anything to come to pass through his sovereign will, uh, you've got to realize that he cannot violate the essence of his character, which is just and holy and righteous. So he is bound by what he is to do what's right. Now Job said in Job 42 and 2, I know that thou canst do everything. In Psalm 33 and 9, David said, For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Now, so God has the ability through simply speaking the word to, to form the worlds. From, from, through speaking the word to call human beings into being, to give life to them. That is how powerful God is. I mean, uh, he's not a man, he's not bound by anything but himself and by his own righteousness, which compels him to do that which is right. Uh, when we were talking last week about the foreknowledge of God and how that God knows, and he said that we are elect from before the foundation of the world, chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world, you've got to couple that with the fact that God has offered salvation to everyone on the face of this earth. That when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he did not just die for the elect and, and not leave any way for others to escape. He died for every man. He tasted death for every man. For God so loved the world, the world, all the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's anybody, anybody who will believe on him, uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. So this, I mean, this is a deep thing when you get into the foreknowledge of God and, and God's sovereign will, when we look at this, hopefully it will help us to understand a little bit more about the foreknowledge. We'll never get it though. We'll, we'll never be able to conceive of the mind of God and, and how he can do all these things. You just have to know that the, the God of the whole earth will do what's right. In 1 Timothy 2 and 4, the word of God says, speaking of God, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So this is part of the divine will of God. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Romans 10 and 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We find in these verses that God has opened the doors of salvation to all who will come, to all who will respond, that God has made the way for any and all to come unto him. Now, how does God's sovereign will work then? I mean, if he's God and he can simply call something into being and it has to happen, how does it work with men? See, we've got a free will. He did not create us as automatons or robots or, or mindless drones that just fulfill his will. We have a mind of our own. We have a heart with which we can purpose either to follow God or to go against God. We have a heart that we can believe in under righteousness or we can deny God and go to the pit. So how does God's sovereign will work? It works by grace, through faith. If you look in Romans chapter number 4, verses 16 and 17, you'll see in Abraham's life a prime example of the sovereign will of God. See, God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. He called him out from his father's house, out from his kindred, and he said, I want to take you to a land that I will show thee. He told him along the way, he said, I will make of thee a great nation, and in thee shall all the people of the earth be blessed. And Abraham followed God for a good long time and nothing ever happened. Abraham, I mean, Abraham's just walking along with God and, and he's got his wife Sarah with him and he's never had a son of his own household. He's never had that promised seed that God had told him he would have. And we find here in Romans chapter number 4, verse 16 and 17, how that this came to pass. That God fulfilled what he spoke many years before it was God's sovereign will that Abraham leave the earth of the Chaldees. It was God's sovereign will that he be the father of the faithful. 
And we'll see how that worked out. It says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed. What does it say in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 8? It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. That's the same thing here. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. It's by grace. And it's of faith to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to that, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now here's God's sovereign will in the thing. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. And then verse 18 says that Abraham, who believed, hope, who, be, who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. We see here that Abraham, he had received the promise from God that he would be the father of many nations, the promise that he would, would, would father a great nation, the nation of Israel. And it wasn't coming to pass. There was no way that Abraham could see it was possible. He was 90 and 9 years old. Sarah's womb had been uh, shut up. She could not possibly conceive a child in the natural realm of things, in the natural uh, way it is with women. But God said that it would happen and it came to pass. And that's the way it is with us. God declares us to be righteous. He declares us to be holy. He declares us to be His sons and declares that we're going to have eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Abraham received the promise of God by faith, by grace, we receive it the same way. Now right now, you might look at yourself and you know you better than anybody but God does. And you know your little faults and your secret sins and you know the things that tear at you and that make you feel like I'm not righteous at all. And we have our walk through life, and, and we struggle, I'm sure, although to a lesser degree, with the same doubts, the, 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 the same uh, disbelief that Abraham had to deal with. I mean, you've got to think about this thing. Here he is, 99 years old, and all he's been through, and yet he's clinging to the promise of God, although he's never seen it. He's never seen it. It's never come to pass. It's never come to fruition in his life. But still, he's believing God because he's God. And he knows that God's able to make it happen. And it's the same way with us. God declared us to be righteous. He imputed unto us the righteousness of his Son. And I'm telling you, the thing that will help us to get over our sins, to get over our doubt, to get over our discouragement, is confidence not in our ability to clean ourselves up. Just as it wasn't Abraham's confidence in himself to generate this seed that God had promised. It was Abraham's faith in the promise of God that allowed it to come to pass. What did it say in verse 16? Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. And that's the same thing with us. So I encourage you, if you are having a problem with a sin, if you have a problem with a doubt or with discouragement, don't think that you can work it out in yourself. Don't think that you have the ability to change yourself and make you what God wants you to be. Only God can do that. What you have to do is what faithful Abraham did is you have to believe the promise of God. And then deliverance will come uh, by faith that it might be by grace. And that's the way it is for us. That's how God's sovereign will works in our life. It's God's will. It, it says, uh, I believe it's in 2 Thessalonians, I can't remember exactly where, but it says that this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, even your sanctification. It's God's will for every Christian to be clean. It's God's will for every Christian to be holy. It's God's will for every Christian to be perfected in the faith and to be conformed to the image of His Son. It's God's will that every one of us have a desire to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Paul desired to know Him in Philippians chapter 3 when he said that I might know Him 
and the power of his resurrection, being made conformable uh, to his sufferings. And that, that is what God's will is for us. But we're not going to do it on our own. We're not going to make it happen ourselves. We have to do it by faith, just as Abraham did. And if we do that, then God's sovereign will will work in our life. It's not like uh, uh, lost people in the natural man, how they set a goal for themselves and then they set about to work and bring things to pass. We do it by faith. That's the big difference. We do it by faith. The next section is, what's God's role in salvation? First of all, it's the fact that he gave his son. Jesus died for all. The Word of God said in uh, John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 5 and 8 says, But God commendeth His love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, For He hath made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 1 Peter 3 and 18 speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ who being put to death in the flesh had suffered for sin. And if we have faith in His sacrifice, the thing that He did, then we are partakers of that. It says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And then we have uh, 1 John chapter 2. And verse number two that says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that's the thing that God's role is in our salvation. The fact that God provided the lamb. God provided the lamb. He provided the sin bearer. He provided the one who would make the payment for our sin. That word propitiation uh, is an interesting word. It means to satisfy God's righteousness uh, which demanded the death penalty against sinners. But there's another thing that it means too, and it's translated back in Romans chapter number 2. This just came to mind. Let me show you this. This is a sweet thing too. In Romans chapter number 2, I believe it is. Oh, I'm sorry. Romans chapter number 3 and verse 25. It's speaking of the Lord Jesus. We'll start in verse 24. It says, "...being justified freely by His grace through the redemption..." that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now that word propitiation right there, the word that's translated that, I don't know Greek, but I, I do have some books that, that have uh, Greek words in them and I can find out what the definitions are. The word translated propitiation here is the same word that's pr translated pr as mercy seat over in Hebrews. See, Jesus Christ, He became our payment. Jesus Christ became our mercy seat. He was the place where the sacrifice was poured out, where the blood was poured out before a holy God, just, just to fulfill the types in the Old Testament in the tabernacle and in the temple. He is our mercy seat. He is our throne of grace. He is everything to us. He is the one that we come to in order to be saved. He's the one that we come to with all our troubles and cares. The Word of God says, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. He's the one that we come to when we need help, when we need strength, when we need mercy. It's all in the Lord Jesus Christ. God desires that all should be saved. In 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Word of God said, the, word, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but it's long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God invites all to be saved. Matthew eleven twenty-eight: 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, and it also says in Revelation 3 and 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. And this is not just uh, New Testament doctrine. This has been occurring throughout the Word of God. God has always called men. He's always called out to men. He's always been their redeemer. He's always been willing to save. In Isaiah 44 and 22, he said to Israel, he said, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me. For I have redeemed thee. Here we see the grace of God. 
I mean, this is a rebellious nation. They're a nation that's about to come under the judgment of God. They're going into, into the captivity in Babylon. They have become idolaters. They've become fornicators. They have intermingled with all the nations about them and become very wicked in the eyes of God. And yet God told them, I have redeemed thee. I've redeemed thee, and he's done the same thing for us. If you're lost, he's done it for you, and he wants you to come to him. He invites you to come. Now, what's man's role in salvation? Man can't save himself. It's impossible for a man to attain to the righteousness of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And uh, by the works of the law... Uh, there shall no flesh be justified, uh, for by the law is a knowledge of sin in Romans 3 and 21. Now, we cannot possibly hope to be good enough, and you know that. You know it right well. Uh, and, and any religion or any uh, uh, Christian denomination that teaches that man has any more to do with saving himself than to trust the promise of God is teaching a lie. I mean, a, a, an outright lie. I mean, there is nothing, no thing in us that merits God's favor. It's totally by grace. Titus 3 and 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy. His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, man's responsibility to God in salvation is this, that he believe the gospel. Jesus said in John 5 and 24, Verily I say unto thee, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. I mean, just simply by believing the Lord Jesus Christ, you pass from death to life. Simply by taking hold of God's promise, you pass from death to life. You go from being a child of Satan to being a child of God through faith. Through faith. That's, that, that is the thing. That's what saves you. And that's why so many people uh, get discouraged is, is they forget. They forget that. And you begin to look at yourself and look at your actions and, and, and count yourself as, as unworthy for eternal life and think, well, I'm, I'm not up to snuff and I'm not this and I'm not that and I'm not the other. And you base your relationship with God on your performance rather than on His promise. And any of us who base our relationship with God on how we do are going to find, if we look at ourselves honestly in the mirror of God's Word, that, that, that we're total rebels against Him. That we have nothing to offer, that we are not worthy to be accepted into His fellowship. But when you look at yourself through the promise of God, like Abraham did. When you look at yourself as one that God has declared to be righteous, when you look at yourself through the blood of Jesus Christ and say, well, God loves me, His Son died for me, He shed His blood for me, and I'm accepted in the Beloved, and I'm going to walk in that, and I'm going to follow God by faith and let God take and purge me and cleanse me and make me fruitful, then you're going to have some victory in your life. You're going to have some fruit in your life and you're going to be somebody who can have communion with God and walk in the joy of the Holy Ghost. But if you try to do it by the flesh, it's going to be a pitiful mess and you'll never make it. It said in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. Paul just defined the gospel that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ, as he says in Galatians chapter number 1. And uh, amazingly, it doesn't contain water baptism. Now, I, I don't know if you listen to the radio much, pr radio preachers, but the Campbellite brethren on there would have you believe that everything in the New Testament revolves around the baptismal pool. That it's there that you're saved, that it's there you make contact with the blood, that that is what puts you into the body of Christ, that that is absolutely, totally essential to your salvation that you be dunked in water. But I'm telling you, and you know it yourselves, that that's not the truth. 
There is a baptism that saves. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and that's a baptism in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, for by one spirit are y'all baptized into one body. They've all been made to drink into one spirit. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 3 through 4, he gives you very plainly what the gospel is. And then in uh, Romans 1 and 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's not tales, it's not illustrations, it's not uh, our ability to speak, it's not our wisdom in the world that saves, it's merely the fact, the old, old story that Jesus loved you and Jesus gave his life for you on Calvary. He shed his blood to cleanse you from your sins and if you'll trust that, God will save your soul. Man must receive Christ as Savior. John 1 and 12 says, But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. No baptism there. Romans 10, 9 and 10, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, not only do we believe, but we repent. We repent. Repentance from the Greek word, uh, and I can't even say it. It means a voluntary and sincere change of mind. To repent, and you know it, is where you turn your back on all that you were and all that you believed and all that you held dear, and you change your direction in regards to God. And repentance is absolutely essential. In Luke 13 and 3, Jesus said, uh, Nay, I say unto you, uh, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. When he's speaking to them, to his people. And, uh, and repentance is not a reformation. It's not turning over a new leaf. Brother Mike Earl, he deals with uh, people from down in the projects. His church is over on Scott off Central Street. And, and he has a very lower echelon type of people in his church. He has uh, people who, who, who are poor, and poor people got poor ways. And he has a lot of people with real bad alcohol and drug problems. I mean, really overrun with sin. They've come out of that environment, and that's all they've known all their lives was drinking and drugs and, and, and total ungodliness. And he's seen it more than once Somebody get in trouble, get a little jailhouse religion, come into his church and stay for a while and leave. And he says they turned over a new leaf. But the trouble with turning over a leaf is that the wind will blow it away the first time it comes along. And that's not what repentance is. And it's not just, just saying, well, I'm going to do better. That's, that, that's, that doesn't constitute repentance either. Uh, it's not remorse. It's not feeling sorry. It's not guilt. I mean, here we have, uh, did you read in the paper the front page story about that girl uh, who murdered that young girl? There's a prime example of somebody who isn't repentant. She had guilt, and she felt remorse, I'm sure, for herself because of the penalty she's under. But she wrote a letter to her boyfriend, and she said, I can't believe this. That's what I get for being nice. She said, I took a piece of pavement and bashed her brains out so she wouldn't have to lay there and bleed to death and suffer and they give me the electric chair. Can you believe the nerve of them people? That See, I mean, she admitted her guilt. She acknowledged she was guilty. And I'm sure that she feels bad about what it's done to her life. But she's never repented of the thing. She, she, she's not changed her mind about it in the least. And that's the thing with salvation. Uh, you have to change your mind about everything that you were before. you got to count all your righteousness as filthy rags. You've got to see yourself as totally, totally wicked and undone and in need of a Savior. And then turn to Him and put all your faith, all your trust, all your hope in Him and turn away from sin. That's what Bible repentance is. Now we speak about eternal security. Eternal life, the security of the believer. And the Bible absolutely teaches eternal security. Absolutely, there's no way around it. I mean, uh, we could get into the thing uh, where it talks about 
be faithful to the end and, and you'll be saved. But of course, in this church, you know that that's referring to the end of a period of time, the end of, the, uh, of Jacob's trouble, the end of the Great Tribulation. Uh, when it speaks of the end in those instances, it's always referring to a, a set period of time that God has determined upon the earth that he is going to bring to an end, and he's telling those Jews, I want you to be faithful till the end, and you'll be saved at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, though, is speaking about the eternal security of the child of God. Uh, the, the teaching is that, that you can be born again, and you can sin and lose your salvation and go to hell. Well, my friends, I mean, that wouldn't be, that'd be like, I've got sons, they were born a Wilson. They grow up, they displease me. What can I do to make them not be my son? There is nothing I can do to change that. And it's the same thing with the child of God. We are sealed by the Spirit of God. We are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And just as my son has within him, within his genetic makeup, the thing that will identify him throughout his whole life as being mine. Oh, he can go, he can dye his hair. He could put, have his eyes changed. He could do anything in the world, but he's still a Wilson. He's still my son. And if you've been born again because of the Holy Ghost which is in you, then you are still God's child. Jesus said uh, that I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. And a lot of people like to grab that one and run with it. But I'm telling you, there's something that precedes that where he said, uh, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. See, and we're to examine ourselves. Uh, whether we be in the faith. We are to, 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 with all diligence, determine if we are abiding in faith. We are to do everything in our power to convince ourselves that we're saved. According to the Word of God, that's one of the duties of the Christian. Let me show you here in Second Peter. When he's talking to him, listen to what he says. Okay. Let me find this thing. In Second Peter 1 and 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that's uh, by His divine power, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this giving all diligence Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Now here it is. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, He's, Peter's instructing us here by the Holy Spirit, and he's saying that once you've found out that you've escaped from the damnation, uh, from, that you've escaped from the power of sin, that you've been saved, once you, once you realize what you are in the Lord Jesus, he wants you to be diligent and add these things to your faith. And he says, if they be in you, they make you uh, that you'll not be unfruitful. And if they be in you, they'll make you that you'll never fall. It says, if you lack those things that were listed, those seven uh, characteristics of a Christian, then you're blind. And then he says again, uh, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. See, we, we do not base our salvation merely on the fact that uh, in vacation Bible school when I was seven years old uh, they said well before we have the Kool-Aid we're going to have an altar call does anybody want to get your black heart made white and I went down and took a cup of Kool-Aid that's not what you base your salvation on you base it on the promise of the Word of God and also on the fact that it's something that's within you something that's within you 
in Romans chapter number 8. There's something else that will show you that you are His. In Romans 8 and 16 it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's the, the witness of the Holy Spirit in your heart. That's the ever-abiding presence of God in your life. I mean, you know He's there. Even when you do wrong, you know He's there. You ever gone to, to do something you knew was a sin and, and you've meditated on it and you thought about it and, and the whole time you're doing it, God's right there with you. He's, he's privy to all your counsel. He's privy to every thought that you've got. And you know that God knows. And you simply cannot get away from the knowledge that God's there. And that God's watching you. And that God's encouraging you not to do what's wrong. See, that's, that's the witness of the Spirit in your heart. That's the check. That's the thing that, that holds you back. That's the thing that helps you know that you're God's. Is you can't do wrong and get by with it. You cannot just set out in your heart and conceive a wicked deed and go through it without having a great struggle and a great battle. And when you do right, the other thing the Holy Ghost does is, is the comfort and the peace and the joy that you have that, that just wells up inside you like Preacher Lawson's talking about. A river of life that flows out of you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It, it's, it's, I, I can't explain it. I never knew it, though, until I was saved. I never knew it. I had a good time, man. I mean, I was a real rocker, you know, and, and I really liked that long hair and that music and all them drugs and everything. Yeah, man, I had fun and I laughed and cut up a lot, but I never knew what joy was until I was born again. I never knew what it was just to be happy. I mean, not to have something entertain me and make me smile. I mean, just to be happy. To have joy and peace and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. To be able to be riding down the street, man, and just, just start laughing and start crying and praising God. for Just because God's just filling you and blessing you so much. That's part of the, of, of the witness of the Holy Spirit within you that you're saved. It may not be the same with you, but you'll know that there are times when you're alone with God and it's just you and God. And the Holy Spirit of God pours a blessing out within you that you can't contain. And man, that's the abundant life right there. That's a foretaste of, of glory divine. That's a foretaste of what's to come. Just imagine what it's going to be on the other side. Hallelujah. I mean, nothing to hold it back. Nothing to stop it. Nothing to hinder the joy of the Lord coming to its fullest in you and you just stay there through all eternity. Man, that's going to be something else. But John 10, 28, 29, as I said again, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We're eternally secure because God's got us. See? All the other uh, denominations just about teach that we have a hold of God and we can let go. They teach that it's our faithfulness instead of faith. See, uh, they teach that, that man has to keep himself. But you know the Word of God concerning a child of God, a born-again blood-bought, Holy Ghost uh, uh, baptized child of God does not keep himself. God keeps him. God keeps him. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that ye have present possession, eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5 and 13. Uh, John three sixteen. we just read. I've quoted John five twenty four to you. Uh, John 6 and 47. Let's get back here and look at this real quickly. John 6, 47, the Word of God says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life, present possession. Uh, John 11, verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Hebrews chapter number 7 and verse number 25. I'm turning there right now. Hebrews 7, 25. The Word of God says, Wherefore He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now, eternal life is the promise that we've received. It's the gift of God. 
Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's something that God has given you, and He won't take it away from you if you've received it. God keeps you. God keeps you. Uh, believers are secure because of God's power. That's what I like about it. That's what I like. It says in John 17 and 2, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5, I've got to turn here and read this. 1 Peter 1, 5. He says, that, oh, I'm just going to start here and read a little bit. In verse number 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, there that thing is again, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Brothers and sisters, we are kept by God. Amen. The same God who sustains the whole universe by the power of His Word sustains us in our faith. The same God who holds the stars in their sockets in the sky that they don't fall to the earth holds you in His hand. Salvation's of the Lord. And the Lord keeps us. He keeps us. He'll never let you go. He that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus in Philippians 1. The Lord God Almighty is our refuge. He's our strength. He is our hope. He's our high tower. He's our defender. He's the one who justified us. If we trust in Him, we believe in Him. He gives unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through His blessed Word. I like what he said, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. When I read that, I get the picture of somebody standing on the seashore and the waves coming in in the evening when the tide is rising and they lap up on them and then they're multiplied and they lap a little further and a little further until they, you're just rocking in it. And that's the way I like to think of the grace of God being multiplied to us, how it just sweeping over us and giving us all that we need. I hope that that's the way it is for you. I hope that you're saved if you're in here. I really do. And those of you who are, I hope that, that, uh, that this is helping you. I know that a lot of these things are rudimentary. They're fundamental Bible doctrines. That's the whole thing. That's what it's about. But, but it's a blessing when you ponder these things. Uh, it's a real blessing. I pray that you'll profit from it as I have. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time that we've had. And, Lord, I pray that you'll help us, Lord, to, again, get back to the beginning, Lord, to, to look at the things that you've done for us when you saved us, Father. Not just to read these things and pass over them, Lord, but to stop and, and throughout the week to ponder and meditate them, Lord, and let them become a part of us. Let them become uh, the things, Lord, that helps us and builds us up, Father. In the, in the name of thy Son, I pray and ask this. Amen.